sex addiction. So now on to the area of sex addiction. This is quite a controversial topic today. It seems sex addiction is on the rise to the point where I get the idea that most of the populace is a sex addict at some level. I guess we can thank psychology for that and the river of clinics, recovery centers, faith-based ministries, and countless books on sex addiction. When you look up addiction, the definition says, quote, the fact or condition of being addicted to a particular substance, things, or activity. Its synonyms are dependency, habit, problem. When reading over the definition, I find many things in life are a habit. I read the Bible a lot. It's a habit. I get up and begin my day usually with a psalm or two. Maybe a proverb and a gospel reading. I also have daily habits like taking a shower, which is a baptism of sort, and going to the gym to stay strong and healthy. I also am in the habit of enjoying intimacy with my spouse. So far, I can't imagine someone calling me an addict because of these things. But when I move out of the normal addictions or habits that most of us have, the addiction becomes a negative. For instance, if you tend to like sex so much that you can't go to work because you want to sit and watch pornography, then I think all of us might look at this as an addiction. But if another likes to watch it now and again, we wouldn't think much of it as a society. We value people's privacy. If it does not hurt another, then it is fine in our culture. If even another person likes to chat online in sexual group chats, that might be okay if it is not a daily occurrence. But at the moment this bit of fun passes an invisible line in the moral fabric of the culture, then it is an online chat addiction. If you are like me, this is all so confusing. Does a person who spends money on golf, which he should spend on getting the car fixed, become a golf addict if he does this behavior long enough? Do we call all large people food addicts? It's very overwhelming. To make things more confusing, what if we take three scenarios? The first guy who considers himself a homosexual. At one time in the country, he would have been deemed a sex addict for his taste. But he is no longer considered an addict because his sexual preference is more accepted in the culture and governmental policies. Was he ever really addicted to sex or was his addiction a label produced by what society deemed abnormal sexual behavior? Is that what we are calling an addiction? The second is a woman who is married to a man who is not that sexually driven. She, on the other hand, desires sex every day with him, but he is not into her suggestions. She ends up deciding to enter into a polyandry lifestyle to which her husband is accepting. She has no desire to leave her husband, and neither does he her. Does the mutual acceptance of the situation nullify her being a sex addict? Or to put it another way, is what makes someone a sex addict based on what is agreed on or not. So if the husband did not agree with her decision, is she now an addict? This one might be closer to home. A monogamous couple likes to have sex once a day on most days. They are like this for years, but upon an accident, one person is not able to perform. The healthy person tends to fantasize of sex, even self-gratifying at times. Are they considered a sex addict because they still desire intimacy and carry around sexual anxiety and stress? What I am getting at is this. What constitutes right sex? It's a subject that when subjugated to personal opinion will vary as people do. I continue to move on with my thoughts. No doubt the luxury of life has given us more leisure time, and filling up that time with things to do has made us all addicts. TV, microwaves, Costco, 
Home Depot, malls, movies, computers, games, Bluetooth, etc. have not helped, but they have made us incredibly independent in our homes, which has led to the addicted life. That's one way to look at it. Looking into our culture from afar could bring us to such a conclusion. We are independently dependent on stuff. We're all addicts. But really, who really is to define what constitutes sex addiction? To the Christian, the idea of addiction is attached closely to the world idolatry. Sensuality that is seen in common life is looked upon as worshipping of the carnal appetites. The Christian does not go about trying to avoid them because it will make him a better person, but he avoids them because there is a better thing to worship. There is a stress on what holds our tension. What might come as a shock to you is that the Christian is against homosexuality as an issue of worship, not primarily because it is two of the same sex. From a biblical perspective, any sexual behavior that is a distortion of what was intended becomes an idol and in turn something that is valued or worshipped over the Creator. Being at University for Music gave me opportunities to play for various composers. Some even wrote the music I would be playing. No matter how good I might have thought I played, the composer would always stop me and make the necessary corrections, ever so slight they seem to be. But to the composer, it was huge. Any shifting from what he created in his mind missed the mark. The only way to please was to acknowledge that his way was right, and do my best to fix it. Though it would take time and effort to move away from bad habits already ingrained, Christianity is concerned with what the composer intended, though we fight this immutability of God's creation ferociously. I will end with this idea on sex addiction. To the person of faith, we all are addicted to something that is called sin. This simply means that daily we miss the mark of perfection, but you knew that. Some might think it's cruel to teach such a doctrine of original sin, But what is the alternative? What if we were to teach mankind had no such thing as sin? Does that make sense with our world of hate, cruelty, and narcissism? Or do we just accept these things as what an animal would do? Christianity is strange. It orders man to recognize that he is vile, even abominable, yet orders him to seek to be like God. Without such a counterbalance, that elevation would make him horribly vain, or that humbling would make him terribly abject. Blaise Pascal, The Christian Life.